Imagine an army that could travel 100 miles a day, fight in any condition, day or night, summer or winter, and outmaneuver any foe. They knew their enemy's moves before they even struck. Trained from birth, these soldiers mastered the bow and horse. Their deadly recurve bows, hitting targets from 300 yards. Agile, lightly armored, they lived off the land, retreating only to return stronger. This was the Mongol army. For nearly two centuries, no force in the known world could match them. They had taken cities, crushed empires, and laid waste to entire regions. But even this unstoppable force would face one of its most humbling setbacks in the second Mongol invasion of Hungary. What changed? How did Hungary, once devastated by the Mongols in 1241, manage to push back this legendary war machine in 1285? It all started when the Mongols developed their military strategies in the open grasslands of the steppes, where their fast cavalry tactics and mobility were highly effective. However, these strategies didn't work as well in the much more confined and rugged terrain of Western Europe. The geography in Europe was very different, and this led to a different style of warfare. In Western Europe, wars were not usually fought in large, open battles. Instead, fighting focused on skirmishes, maneuvers, and especially sieges. This was because the land was full of castles, and from the 9th century onwards, these castles became the main defense system in Europe. These fortifications were so effective that, despite being heavily outnumbered, European forces were able to maintain control of crusader kingdoms like Carac, Montreal, and Crac de Chevalier. While the Mongols were skilled at siege warfare, they would have faced a massive challenge in conquering Western Europe. European castles were far more numerous and stronger than the fortifications the Mongols had faced elsewhere. Trying to bypass castles wouldn't have worked long term. Any Mongol forces that tried to ignore the castles would have just been engaging in raids, not real conquests. History proves this. In Ottonian Germany, the Magyars tried similar tactics, but were defeated in the long run because European defenders could retreat into castles, then attack the Magyars when this nomads were bogged down by difficult terrain, and defenders could wait out attackers inside castles forcing besieging armies to either starve or withdraw. Although people often focus on the Mongols' success in Hungary in 1241, they forget about their massive failure in 1285. Now, we look back briefly at the first Mongols' invasion in Hungary. At Battle of Mohi 1241, an enormous Mongol invasion force defeated the Hungarians and their allies for a year. The Mongols pillaged and ravaged the countryside when the invaders finally withdrew a quarter of Hungary's population had been slaughtered, and virtually all of the towns and villages had been destroyed. After the disastrous defeat at Mohi, the Hungarians learned their lesson and saw the flaw in the Mongols' tactics. King Bela IV of Hungary realized his country's defenses were inadequate. Hungary had few fortified positions. Indeed, many of its cities had no walls at all. At that time, Hungary had only ten stone castles, mostly near the border with Austria, the Mongols easily destroyed the wooden and earthen fortifications with their siege engines. To improve defenses, Bela IV oversaw the construction of nearly 100 new fortresses by the end of his reign. This was a significant increase and aimed to protect against future invasions. Before, Hungary had relied mostly on wooden castles and light cavalry. The light cavalry that made up most of the Hungarian mounted forces had proven ineffective against the Mongol troops, though the few heavily armored knights mostly those of the Knights Templar, performed significantly better when engaged in close quarters combat. He realized that the country needed more effective military forces. To improve this, Bela IV created a new class of heavily armored knights similar to those in Western Europe. In 1247, he made a deal with the Knights of St. John, giving them land in southeastern Hungary. In return, they helped him build more armored cavalry and fortifications. In 1248, Bela IV made a rule that the middle class could serve as knights if they joined a baron's service. The barons had to provide well-equipped armored soldiers to the king's army. This policy helped strengthen Hungary's military. Two years later, people who owned small or medium-sized estates and served directly under the king were also considered nobility. New settlers were granted conditional nobility if they agreed to fight as mounted and armored soldiers when needed. 
The Hungarian army improved so dramatically that the envoy of King Charles I of Anjou reported enthusiastically to him. The Hungarian royal house has incredible power. Its military forces are so large that nobody in the east and the north dares even budge if the triumphant and glorious king mobilizes his army. Most of the countries and princes of the north and east belong to his empire by kinship or conquest. In addition, Bela IV initiated a new wave of colonization by inviting groups from Germany, Moravia, Poland, and Romania to settle in the region. This not only boosted economic development, but also increased the population and created a new labor force. These settlers also provided soldiers, which helped strengthen Hungary's military capabilities and readiness to defend the country against future military threats. In 1259, King Bela IV of Hungary reached out to the Pope, seeking assistance in contacting Venice with the aim of hiring at least 1,000 crossbowmen. Venice boasted a long-standing military tradition, particularly noted for its naval prowess and the effective deployment of crossbowmen. Beside that, they was also recognized for its skilled infantry, which excelled in both land and naval engagements. Bela IV likely understood that Venice could provide highly trained troops, essential for strengthening Hungary's defenses against future invasions. This initiative reflected a broader effort to modernize Hungary's military capabilities in light of the challenges posed by formidable adversaries like the Mongols. This strategic move was influenced by the effectiveness of crossbows in previous confrontations with the Mongols, despite their limited use by the Hungarians during the invasion of 1241. And then, we have some debate that why Mongols suddenly retreat from Hungary. Like I mentioned in the beginning, Mongol did not suit to, to the climate in Europe especially that Hungary had cold wet weather in early 1242, which likely turned Hungary's central plain into a huge swamp. So, lacking pastures for their horses, the Mongols would have had to fall back to Ruse in search of better grasslands. After the withdrawal from Hungary and the deaths of Ogede Khan and Batu Khan, the Mongol Empire began to split into various candidates including the Golden Horde in the West. This division not only weakened central authority, but also led to power struggles among regional leaders. In this context, Nogai Khan, a significant leader of the Golden Horde, emerged as a highly influential figure. Although he never officially ruled the Golden Horde, he effectively co-ruled the state with any Khan in power at the time, exerting unrestricted control over the western parts of the Dnieper. He not only had strategic vision, but also the ability to lead the Mongol army in wars against external enemies. Nogai Khan sought to increase his power through conquests in Europe. Accompanying him was Talabuga, a young Mongol prince. Talabuga commanded the army during the Mongol invasion of Lithuania in 1258 to 1259, a campaign in which he distinguished himself. A year later, Talabuga led the second Mongol invasion of Poland alongside Nogai Khan, both under the overall command of Burundi. After ravaging Poland and capturing around 10,000 Poles as slaves, Nogai and Talabuga planned a second invasion of Hungary, an ally of Poland, believing that Hungary was weakened by internal conflicts. One of the key reasons for Hungary's weakened state was the growing power of the nobility and the constant rebellions from the barons. After the death of Bela IV, Hungary's internal political structure became fragmented. His son, Stephen V, ruled only briefly, and his grandson, Ladislaus IV, ascended to the throne in 1272. Ladislaus IV, known as the Cuman, due to his Cuman heritage through his mother, struggled to exert strong centralized control over Hungary. The power of the Hungarian barons had increased considerably by this time and they often acted independently of the king. These noblemen had their own interests, frequently leading revolts or forming alliances that defied royal authority. The lack of unity between the monarchy and the aristocracy left Hungary politically fractured and unable to muster a coordinated defense in the face of potential invaders. Ladislaus IV's rule was further complicated by his reliance on the Cumans, a Turkic nomadic group that had sought refuge in Hungary during his grandfather's reign. The Cumans had fled to Hungary after being displaced by the Mongols. King Bela IV had allowed them to settle in Hungary, but over time, tensions between the Cumans and native Hungarians grew. 
Ladislaus often utilized Cuman warriors for military purposes, but this reliance on foreign troops caused considerable resentment among the Hungarian aristocracy. Many nobles accused the Cumans of disloyalty and believed that they did not have the kingdom's best interests at heart. Ladislaus IV's favoritism towards the Cumans alienated many Hungarian nobles, who viewed the Cumans as outsiders. In 1283, Ladislaus even abandoned his wife and took a Cuman woman as a mistress, which made the Cumans even more unruly. The Cuman rebellion in 1282 had been suppressed by the Hungarian nobility. The Cuman warriors who were driven out of Hungary offered their services to Nogai Khan, the de facto leader of the Golden Horde, and informed him about the dangerous political situation in Hungary. And of course, Nogai and Talabuga, sensing this internal instability, saw an opportunity to finally conquer the Hungary kingdom. Therefore, nearly 15 years after Beleth's death, the Mongols returned to Hungary in 1285, like a part two of their earlier invasion in 1241. They followed a similar playbook, splitting their forces into two main groups. Nogai Khan came through Transylvania, while Talabuga pushed in through Transcarpathia and Moravia. They even sent a smaller group straight into the center of Hungary, kind of retracing the steps of Kadan from the first invasion. Their strategy was similar too, speed and surprise. This strategy was already used in the invasion of the Khwarezmian Empire under Genghis Khan, where the Mongol army split into smaller units, advancing through multiple routes to give the impression of a much larger force. This division allowed them to overwhelm the Khwarezmians, who couldn't predict where the next attack would strike, leading to their downfall. Similarly, in their campaigns against the Song Dynasty, the Mongols relied on rivers as fast transport routes, moving quickly to catch the Song forces off guard. They also utilized a comprehensive intelligence network, gathering crucial information about enemy weaknesses. This allowed the Mongols to strike decisively and with precision, ensuring their dominance across southern China. And now, they invaded in winter, hoping to catch the Hungarians totally off guard. By moving so fast, they wanted to prevent King Ladislaus from pulling together a large enough army to face them in one big, decisive battle. The Mongols were all about picking apart their enemies bit by bit. This time around, the Mongols had fewer distractions, no civil wars in their empire or big battles elsewhere. So Nogai was able to bring a massive army to the party. Some sources describe it as a great host, but the size of the Mongol invasion force led by Nogai and Talabuga into Hungary has been widely debated. While some contemporary sources suggest an army numbering around 200,000, this figure is almost certainly exaggerated as Mongol armies rarely exceeded 100,000. Other estimates, comparing the invasion with the 1287 attack on Poland, place the Mongol force at around 30,000. Some historical accounts even describe vast Mongol camps covering extensive areas, adding to the myth of their overwhelming numbers. However, modern historians tend to believe that the number of Mongol forces was roughly 30,000 to 50,000, including cavalry forces from their vassal states, like the Ruthenian princes, which added more punch to the invasion. They typically wore chainmail or scale armor, providing light but flexible protection that allowed for quick movement. Their helmets were made of steel and featured designs to protect the face and neck, which was standard for the army. Their main weapons included short bows, which were powerful and compact, enabling them to shoot accurately from horseback. Additionally, Mongol troops were equipped with curved swords and spears, allowing effective attacks, both at range and in close combat. They also used maces and axes to smash through their opponent's armor. Hungary, meanwhile, likely had a maximum defense force of about 30,000 men, including local troops such as Saxons, Vlachs, and Zekli were mobilized to resist the Mongols. So, now, Talabuga, leading the main Mongol force, ran into some serious trouble right off the bat. They hit northern Hungary, but the Carpathians threw heavy snow at them, making things rough. Even before that, they were already hurting. Logistical nightmares like food shortages were killing off a lot of Mongol soldiers. This wasn't just bad luck. It's likely because the Hungarians were playing the long game that made the invasion not unfold as Nogai expected. Like Napoleon said, never fight the same enemy too often or you will teach him everything you know of war. It really happened in this invasion. Talabuka's army struggled with food shortages because the Hungarians had learned from their past defeat in 1241. 
many villagers had evacuated to fortified castles, taking their supplies and livestock with them, leaving the Mongols with nothing to plunder. Thanks to the application of advanced agricultural technology, including heavy plows, productivity, and rural life improved, ensuring a stable food supply and the ability for the Hungarian army to be self-sufficient in case of a siege. It was so severe that Polish and Galician sources mentioned thousands of Mongols dying during the march. When Talabuka's forces attacked Pest, they found the town deserted, with its inhabitants safely sheltered in nearby castles. Meanwhile, Queen Elizabeth's entourage wasn't just sitting around. They launched a pretty bold attack from Buddha's walls, which is a cool side note. Now, let's get to the heart of the matter, the decisive battle in Western Transylvania. Talabuga's weakened army ran into the Royal Hungarian forces, led by none other than King Ladislaus IV himself. Unlike the Mongols' previous encounter in 1241, the Hungarians were ready. Their army, though not huge, had been bolstered by heavily armored knights, a military reform that had taken place after the first invasion. Even though these knights were few, and probably had low morale after all the tension, they were key in this battle. Hungarian knights typically wore chainmail hauberks with iron helmets, carrying long swords, lances, and shields. Ladislaus's forces also included infantry and crossbowmen, who used pikes, spears, and crossbows for ranged combat. Here's how it played out. The Mongols, masters of mobile warfare and archery, usually excelled in hit-and-run tactics, using their light cavalry to harass and exhaust their enemies. But the Hungarian knights were built for close, heavy combat. Ladislaus's forces timed their charge perfectly, catching Talabuga's army off guard. The Mongols couldn't break through the ranks of these well-armored knights, and their usual tactics weren't working. The Mongols were soundly defeated. Talabuga, recognizing that things were going south fast, ordered a retreat. But here's where it gets worse for the Mongols. On their retreat through the Carpathians, they were ambushed by the Cumans, who struck with swift light cavalry, just like the Mongols had done to so many of their enemies before. The tables had turned. This ambush was devastating, and Talabuga's army was almost entirely wiped out. By the time he limped back into Mongol territory, it was said that he returned with nothing but his wife and a single horse. Now, that's probably an exaggeration, but it does emphasize just how badly his forces were crushed. While all this was going down, Nogai Khan, another Mongol commander, was having his own troubles. He stayed behind in Transylvania until the spring of 1286, raiding and pillaging as much as he could. Towns like Regin, Brashov, and Bistritsa suffered under his raids. But like Talabuga, Nogai couldn't capture any major castles. These Hungarian fortifications, combined with their new military tactics, proved too strong. Plus, the Mongols didn't have the right siege equipment to take these fortified positions. After defeating Talabuga, King Ladislaus IV wasn't content to just let Nogai continue his raids. He gathered his forces and moved to confront him. By the time Ladislaus caught up with Nogai's army though, local Hungarian and Romanian troops, led by Roland Borsa, had already done most of the heavy lifting. They had decimated Nogai's army, leaving only stragglers. Ladislaus didn't have to do much beyond harassing the retreating Mongols as they fled. By the end of the campaign, both Talabuga and Nogai Khan were forced to retreat. And that was the end of the second invasion of Mongols in Hungary as well. So, here's the thing. Hungary did manage to eventually crush the Mongols. But man, what a mess it was for the king politically. Just like what happened with his grandfather, people were quick to point fingers at him, accusing him of inviting the Mongols in, all because of his ties to the Cumans. And that wasn't even the worst part. What really made it a disaster was that the king didn't do much in terms of defending the kingdom. While the local barons and powerful nobles were stepping up to protect their lands from the Mongol invasion and gaining more influence, the Mongols themselves were losing steam in the region. After their heavy losses in Hungary, the Mongols didn't have the same firepower to launch major operations in Central Europe like before. Sure, they had a temporary victory when they revassalized Bulgaria, but after the 1280s, their actions in Hungary were mostly limited to small raids and pillaging. 
not full-scale invasions, especially under Uzbeg Khan. Because the Mongols were no longer as much of a threat, the local nobles, who had proven they could handle things without much help from the king, began to act even more independently. Their ability to defend against the Mongols on their own boosted their power and influence, which made the king's already fragile control even weaker. With the Mongols no longer launching major campaigns, these local elites had more breathing room to expand their networks and take over large parts of the kingdom, basically ruling their own territories like mini-kingdoms. In fact, by 1345, Hungary even went on the offensive. Led by Count Andrew Lakfi, they actually invaded Mongol territory and defeated a Golden Horde force. That's when they captured what would later become Moldavia. So, the tables had definitely turned by then. So, you know how surviving a defeat can teach you a lot, right? Well, the second Mongol invasion of Hungary is exactly one of those moments. But it also shows something pretty interesting about the Golden Horde. They kind of stopped evolving. While the Mongols in China and the Middle East were learning new techniques, adopting new technologies, and improving their tactics, the Golden Horde was stuck in their old ways. When they invaded southern China, the Mongol army was almost like a Chinese army with Mongol leadership, using advanced siege tactics and technology. Hulagu, the Mongol leader who conquered the Middle East, had some of the best engineers from across Eurasia. But the Golden Horde, the group in Eastern Europe, stayed with their traditional steppe-style warfare. Lots of light cavalry, but very few heavy infantry or siege engineers. Why didn't they adapt after losing in Hungary? Probably because their style of fighting was still good enough for controlling the wide open steppe where they lived, so they didn't see the need for change. It was one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it situations, even if it meant getting stuck in the past. As we look back on Hungary's desperate struggle against the Mongols, one can't help but wonder, what if the second Mongol invasion had succeeded? What if the Hungarian fortifications crumbled, the nobles couldn't rally, and Europe fell deeper into Mongol control? The very fabric of medieval Europe, its cultures, borders, and power dynamics would have been irrevocably changed. Imagine a Europe where the Mongol Khans reigned supreme, reshaping the West with their war-hardened warriors. It's not just a question of what if. This is the history that almost was, a future narrowly avoided. But what if it had happened? Let's dive deeper into the untold stories, explore the battles that could have reshaped Europe forever, and discover the unstoppable force of the Mongols. Join us in this journey through time, where the past is full of thrilling twists and turns. Subscribe, and let's unravel history together.